However, ever the issue is different with respect to moral enhancement. In my talk, I explain why moral bioenhancement is an obstacle for the good life for most human beings. In order to have a morally better way of dealing with the various challenges related to emerging technologies and their potential to enhance human beings, it seems more plausible to promote cognitive capacities directly instead of using moral enhancement. As Harris seems correct in stressing that cognitive capacities also promote the likelihood of our being moral. I'll put forward some reasons for underlying this point. I'll progress as follows. <coughs> Firstly, I will provide some reasons for arguing against Savalesco in person that there has not been any significant moral progress since Confucius, Buddha and Socrates. Thereby, I'll provide reasons for claiming that moral and co cognitive developments are parallel procedures. Secondly, I will focus on moral enhancement which aims for the reduction of harm done directly to individuals, as I regard this version as the most promising one. To promote pro-social behavior by means of oxytocin might also be a realistic option, but it faces similar challenges as the ver version I'm focusing on. The reduction of acrasia and the promotion of respect for and acts in accordance with the norms of freedom and equality, however, are extremely complex goals which I do not expect to become relevant options in the not-so-distant future. Uh, the same applies to Zabalesco's um, God Machine. I'll put forward reasons for claiming that the type of moral enhancement on which I'm focusing is neither in the interest of a country nor in that of most individuals. The relationship between cognitive and moral developments. Harris regards the advancements of our cognitive capacities as related to an advancement of mora morality, and I agree with him. One reason which supports this point of view is the following observation concerning the development of morality in history. It also directly goes against the position put forward by Pearson and Savalescu who claim we hypothesize in our paper that this might be a reason why the degree of moral improvement since the time of Confucius, Buddha and Socrates has been so small in comparison to the degree of technological progress despite moral education, unquote, from a paper from this year. This observation seems highly implausible as there are several reasons for claiming the opposite. By the way, it might be interesting to know that Kant in his anthropology also talked about the historical progress which is determined by various conflicts and which leads to the human perfection concerning morality. His position is founded upon a strange theologi teleological understanding of the historical development. But his observation that conflict leads to moral improvement is at least noteworthy in this context. I assume that morality is related to the notions of norms of negative freedom and equality. These norms have only been developed during the Enlightenment. Hence, I wonder how it's possible to think that these norms have been in practice and respected without them having been realized consciously, which several as a person would have to assume, given that they hold that, that there has not been any significant moral progress. Historical studies make it clear that neither the norm of negative freedom nor that of equality did play any role in ancient Greek and Roman societies, as well as in medieval Christian countries. Political systems were strongly hierarchical in antiquity. People took it for granted that they are natural born slaves. Even the greatest ethical thinkers of their times, like Aristotle, agreed to this understanding. The same applies to the Holy Roman Empire during the Middle Ages. <coughs> Furthermore, how can one even imagine that the norm of negative freedom has played any role in communities before the Enlightenment? Citizens were forced to agree with the religious, metaphysical, and ethical beliefs of the religious and political rulers of the country. Socrates was sentenced to death because of a disrespect concerning the gods. Political and re religious reactions concerning witches, Giordano Bruno thoughts, and some writings of Hugo Procius, Galileo Galilei, and even Schopenhauer Sartre, who was once the last writer to be listed in the Index Librorum, Prohibitorum of the Catholic Church, are certainly further confirm confirmations of this assessment. The Enlightenment period has been one in which thinkers, 
scientists, writers, soldiers and normal citizens have been fighting for their right to live according to their own concept of a good life. They no longer wish to be forced and constrained by their religious and political leaders to be told how to live their lives. It was primarily the wish on which, this wish on which most of the central enlightenment developments occurred. The French Revolution, the increase of relevance of the natural sciences, and the development of technologies by engineers are related to the fight against the dominance of Christian religious and political leaders, so that it was possible for a move away from a totalitarian religious system towards a liberal democratic political structure to occur. On the intellectual level, philosophers from Descartes, via Locke and Kant, have supported this development in the same way as artists and writers like Leonardo da Vinci or Marquis de Sade. How then can anyone even imagine that there has not been any significant moral improvement in the time of Confucius, Buddha and Socrates? Given that there has been a clear moral progress from the Middle Ages to our times concerning many citizens of enlightened and some of the non-enlightened countries, it might be possible to relate this insight to the adva advancement of our cognitive capacities, and I regard it as highly plausible that such an advancement has occurred too. There has been an incredible progress with respect to technologies, the sciences and mathematics during the previous 2000 years. Hence there was a human need to develop further more specific and more detailed cognitive capacities for dealing with the advancement physiologically. Consequently, there are reasons for holding that there is a correlation between moral and cognitive advancements. This also supports the position that further cognitive advancement processes might lead to a kind of further moral enhancement, and contra person and Savulescu, such a development does not have to be feared. Moral enhancement as obstacle of a good life. Person and Savulescu see dangers as related to the development of emerging technologies, even the risk of global destruction without any moral bioenhancement. Hence, they argued in favor of the need of moral bioenhancement, and in a paper from 2008, they even argued in favor of obligatory moral enhancement. In the following passages, I will question that moral enhancement can sensibly be implemented, as I regard it as an obstacle of a good life for most human beings. Thereby, I'll focus on moral enhancement as related to the reduction of direct harm done to individuals, as it seems to me as the most promising technology, especially given the scientific research undertaken by Molly Crockett and the heated debate about it afterwards. Moral enhancement as legal obligation. One way of arguing in favor of moral enhancement as legal obligation is to show an analogy with vaccinations. Even though this analogy works in many ways, it fails with respect to a central premise. Health is a stage which is in the interest of most human beings. The act of directly harming an individual human being, on the other hand, can be a moral act and even be a politically necessary act. To guarantee inner and outer security, the police and the army is needed to have the right and the need to use force against individuals. The same applies to others who are in a situation where such force is needed, whereby the case of Jasper Scheringer, who, um, who was successful against the shoe bomber, is only an extreme example. There are many everyday examples which could be mentioned in this context. It is a need to use force against violent young people who act aggressively against old people in an underground train. These examples make it clear that it cannot be in the interest of a country to render moral bioenhancement technologies legally compulsory, because such a regulation in the end might even endanger the existence of a state in question. Non-morally enhanced citizens from other countries, with its state why, in which it's compulsory for citizens to become morally enhanced, consequently there will be citizens which endanger the inner order of a state why, by means of violent acts, fraud, robbery, and other crimes. Furthermore, statewide, also risks to be invaded by other countries whose soldiers are not morally bioenhanced. Morally enhanced soldiers who have the tendency not to harm other individuals directly will not be able to fill well their duties. Um, 
um, and which endangers the existence of state Y. Due to the risk of inner and outer security associated with moral enhancement technologies, living in a state in which these technologies are legally compulsory is not in the interest of most human beings, as a good life usually requires a safe environment. In state in which inner and outer security is at risk does not provide such an environment. Moral enhancement as free choice. One interest individuals can have to become morally enhanced is to get rid of sanctions from which a pers person is threatened or which have been imposed on someone. The, this case is represented well by the repeat offender, which he a rapist, who is being offered freedom if he's willing to undergo moral enhancement. In this case, chemical enhancement, chemical castration can be seen as a moral enhancement. However, the motivation of the offender to choose moral enhancement was to get rid of the sanction, namely the sanction of being imprisoned. Still, the procedure of chemical castration is not necessarily in his interest as he enjoys sexual inti intimacy and it might be a central piece for his own well-being. He's merely sacrificing a part of his well-being to enable him um, his not being imprisoned. Concerning living a good life, I can even imagine that raping someone can be intrinsically connected to someone's concept of a good life. Only by raping someone he can feel fulfilled. I'm not defending rape in any way by making this statement. I'm merely trying to hint at the possibility that there can be and usually is a huge gap between a moral life and someone's good life. Here, someone's good life is connected to the act of rape. However, such behavior is neither legally nor morally acceptable in most, if not all, kinds of societies. Hence, there is the need to sanction rapists. It also needs to be acknowledged that living in a society can mean that one has to limit one's possibility of living a good life. What about the case of a religious believer, Zed, who is being threatened with eternal torture if she acts immorally? Zed holds that by being moral, she can increase the likelihood of having a blessed afterlife. In her current life, however, she has got the tendency to attack people when she does not regard herself being treated appropriately. Consequently, she decides to reduce the risk of being sanctioned in afterlife by undergoing moral enhancement. On the one hand, there is a tendency of beating up someone if she feels humiliated and beating up the other person makes her feel good because she knows that she's strong and that by, her, by affirming her being stronger than someone else, she provides her with a feeling of excitement which she usually does not have during most periods of her life. Hence, it can be the case that this aggressiveness in her being in a fight is closely connected to her feeling well and feeling alive that both parts are essentially connected to her leading a good life. Such acts, however, are legally and morally forbidden. Again, her ideal of a good life, which is essentially connected with her aggressiveness, is being limited by her living in a society and by her being a believer who holds that she will be tortured in the afterworld for her aggressive behavior. It seems clear that people may decide to undergo moral enhancement to avoid being sanctioned. Um, in the case of the religious people said, her behavior can lead to her being sanctioned both in this world as well as in the afterlife. By being more moral, she can reduce the likelihood of this happening to her. If there were no political, moral or religious sanctions, then it's highly likely that the people mentioned here would not be interested in moral enhancement because their morally problematic acts are also the ones which provide them with an intense feeling of happiness, being fulfilled and being excited. Hence, the question needs to be addressed whether moral enhancement can be of interest for people who are not in a comparable situation and who are not afraid of being sanctioned. For example, the ones who stick to legal prescriptions but are not interested in morality because they regard anything legal but also as morally legitimate. An example of such a person could be a sad masochist couple. It makes him happy and fulfilled if she tortures him in all imaginable ways. Moral enhancement would not be an option for them as it would clearly decrease their capacity for living a good life. 
Is it necessary to, to refer to seemingly, seemingly extreme cases to claim that moral enhancement is not in the interest of most people and hence would not be chosen freely by them? I think it's necessary to realize that most people, for most people, that there is a gap between their concept of a good life and the moral demand to reduce the tendency of directly doing harm to an individual, which is a type of moral enhancement I'm focusing on. The following three short examples exemplify further how important directly doing harm to an individual can be for most of us, or how important aggressive behavior can be for most of us. Firstly, there's the example of you wishing to enter a bus and there being some young men who try to get in before you, even though they just arrived at the bus stop. Here, a certain verbal force, um, which is directly di directed at them, is appropriate. If you do not get into the bus, um, but they do, you would feel bad. This is a very simple but poignant example which supports my basic insight that morality is usually in the interest of the immoral. Here the young men are immoral and manage to reach their goal, to get into the bus. You do not, even though you act morally properly. Secondly, is there an increased tendency of not doing direct harm to an individual? Uh, maybe some, even some professions might end, like a bed of uh, fishermen might have a dialogue. Thirdly, there's a case of you trying to talk to a girl in a club, but there's also your more talkative and pushy friend. Of course, he managed to, to push you away from her and the conversation, um, and he manages to have a great evening with her. Again, it's you being directly, uh, someone being directly aggressive to you, which enables him to have a great time and causes you to be sad and lonely. All three examples reveal the tension between a concept of leading a good life and the importance of direct aggression against another uh, living being, which helps you leading a good life, which can help you, at least, leading a good life. I'm not assuming a strong and detailed concept of the good by, by making this judgment. I'm merely trying to show that a certain aggression of power, violence, and strength is a relevant aspect within most concepts of a good life. By promoting moral enhancement in the way dealt with here, in the meaning the reduction of inclination of doing direct harm to an individual, it becomes clear that it's highly probable that there will be a clash between the concept of morality and many, if not most, concepts of the good life. I'm assuming that a good life is immediately connected to someone's physiopsychology and that these are radically different among human beings. Any, uh, any non-formal account of the good pens is bound to be implausible. One aspect relevant for many people, however, is their will to live, to have developed capacity with special standing in their community. Due to both elements being relevant for a good life, it's highly likely that there's a tension between an increased tendency of not um, harming and um, some of our, most of our concepts of the good. I'm now coming to the conclusion. In part two, I put forward some reason why it's neither in the interest of a state nor in that of an individual to use moral enhancement. If a state made it legally obligatory to use moral enhancement, then it would risk its own existence and reduce, reduce the stability of its own inner and outer security. As stately security usually promotes a good life of human beings, Moral enhancement in this case represents an obstacle for a good life. This is also the case for the option of freely choosing moral enhancement. Freely choosing moral enhancement is not in someone's interest, as it decreases the likelihood of someone's leading a good life. Again, moral enhancement is an obstacle for a good life. However, this analysis does not imply that human, humanity's future is likely be, to be doomed, as person in Savalesco's text sometimes seems to imply. Given the parallel developments of moral attitudes and cognitive capacities from part one of my talk, there are reasons for holding um, that there is still hope for not having to face global human extinction in the future. Given the above analysis, it seems likely that morality is promoted better by means of cognitive advancements and enhancement, as Harris has already suggested. Di direct moral bioenhancement might only be in the interest of people who can use it to avoid being sanctioned, which can, can be the case for prisoners as well as for some traditional religious believers. Thanks a lot for your attention.
We have about 20 minutes for discussion. Uh, sorry, I, I, I know you were there, I can't remember your line, but anyway. Uh, it's over. Um, so yeah, I guess I was, uh, I was curious about these arguments you're putting forward. It makes sense that moral enhancement isn't generally in the interest of person reporting to enhance. But, but I was wondering whether you really want to say that it's not in the interest of the state. Because you're committed, I think you're committed to saying the Enlightenment advances, those were good for states, right? Like the, the, the democracy, human rights, moral equality, that was good for states, right? It was a benefit to states. I think it's in the interest, the developments of the Enlightenment, and now that we've, we've um, sort of a high respect for the norms of freedom and equality, something which is in, in the interest of, of human beings. That's what they've been fighting for. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you could, you could have thought that somebody who's maybe the enlightenment is, you know, is occurring, and someone's sitting up and well, okay, maybe this morality is all well and good, but this is going to make you weak. You know, you're, you're going you're gonna to have moral equality, then you won't be able to enslave people, you'll have an inefficient economy. You have you know, all these demo democratic freedoms, this will lead to, to, to riots, and this will lead to all these unrest. The same sort of considerations that you seem to say could apply to a morally enhanced society, but also seems to undermine the stability of an enlightened society because of the very same considerations would make them weaker. So do you think that there's something about the Enlightenment that, that, that overcame that, that, that made, a, made a good for the case, or something like that? Why would it be the case that the same factors could overall make moral enhancement uh, of a biological kind? Well, firstly, I, I was just talking about a certain type of moral enhancement, namely the type of moral enhancement which reduces the tendency to do direct harm to an individual. Because this is maybe by by applying Tsita uh, Lubram, you know, you can you can uh, you can alter the level of ser serotonin, and that, so hence we've got a reason to hold that this might be possible to alter um, the action in, in this way. Um, I'm not talking about sort of some, some ideal of uh, ideal type of moral enhancement because at the moment I, I couldn't even imagine how, how it would work out. So I'm focusing on, on some more pragmatic, realistic points. Sure. Um, so is that in the interest of a country if, if, if um, the tendency to inflict direct harm on someone is being reduced? If it applies universally, I mean, um, it, it weakens the state, it weakens the stability of the state because it will only apply in one country, but it won't apply in all the other countries. So it applies to, to soldiers, it applies members of other, um, of other countries can come, who are not morally enhanced can come in, into the country, um, they will introduce fraud and robbery and whatever. And hence, um, it would have to be applied in a universal sense if it made, if it, uh, um, if, if it would have to be, um, Imposed or made obligatory in the whole world or in, in, in all countries if it made sense at all. Yeah, I guess my worry is that only a lot of enlightenment reforms made the country weaker. So, so if, you have, if you have equality, you can no longer, you know, just uh, it's like a filter and prison at will. If you have human rights, you can no longer do whatever you want in war. And Western democracies have adopted a lot of these uh, uh, in, um, uh, moral developments that really have the effect of reducing the amount of harm the state can do to its citizens. And, and, and then currently you have democracies, Western democracies that people think are great, and a lot of uh, other despotic countries that don't recognize human rights. But it's not the case that you know, the, the, the countries that don't recognize human rights have kind of invaded uh, and taken over the, uh, the democratic states. I think the, the strength of a country is independent actually of the political form. I mean, it just depends on, on how much uh, a country invests in, in inner and outer security. Um, but then if that's right, we can apply that solution. If strength is independent of morality, they can enhance morality and we'll have a, an independent, a independently strong state to avoid these kinds of weaknesses that you pointed out. But you couldn't in, in, in enhance the strength or because the aggression, because this is exactly um, the aspect which is obligatory uh, being, being de-enhanced in, in all the members of the country. So it goes against the interests um, um, concerning the security now issues. Now I'm stopping you. Uh, Thomas, now. I wonder whether your assumption about the tension between a good life and moral enhancements uh, depends on the frequency of the people who will be morally enhanced. Is, is, is this frequency dependent? If you have much more people uh, enhanced, uh, wouldn't this somehow increase the possibility of a good life on average in, in such a state? I think. Um, 
So you think the, the good life by, by more people um, having yeah, moral sure. standards? But I'm, as I said, I, I was talking about the specific concept of moral standards, in, of, 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 of moral enhancement. And in this case, just the reduction to, to inflict direct harm on, on someone else. Um, do, do you want to take it in a more yeah, open yeah. sense? or, or um, yeah, you, you didn't consider that, you know, the moral enhancement on a collective basis. No, for, uh, firstly, I, I was merely considering in, in, in one specific country, not on a global, on a, on a global basis. But um, um, I think the concept of, of the good life is actually uh, is, is, is independent of, 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 um, of whether it's done on a global scale or uh, solely on, in, one in one specific country. Because it's what I was trying to hint at and show it, and what's being revealed also, um, that that, um, well, the fantasy, the tribes, the passions, um, which are so closely connected to someone's leading a good life, um, are, are so, so diverse in us human beings. Yeah. They become revealed just by mentioning the, the various chat rooms and the internet, by what people dream at night, what we, each, each one of us, doesn't dare to say to, to another and would be ashamed to if, if, if he or she, if it was revealed what we in secret, what really fascinates us, what really turns us on. So what is in not closely connected to what makes us human beings go, what, what uh, fascinates us, what is connected to leading a good life. And, um, and there's very open, I mean, one of, um, and one of the central premises and uh, one of the central elements, which is not there universally, but which I think is there in most human beings. And why, um, why I think it's also what uh, Savalescu said earlier, on, oh yeah, um, if we would be morally enhanced if we would became more, more like women. Well, I think it's good, this plurality, this diversity. The diversity is both good in evolutionary sense, but it's also, also good that we fulfill all the various roles in the society. That that some ones can be rather the, the warriors, the soldiers, the ones who are being more um, pushy and aggressive in the field of economics or in, in other circumstances where it's, where it's important to be like this. Um, um, but if one, if one uh, alters the moral attitude in that respect, one, one reduces it, um, the inclination to directly harm someone else, um, that diversity would, would vanish. It would lead to maybe also homogenization of society, but I wouldn't, that wouldn't be necessarily, um, that's not necessarily the very I've, I've been talking about. Just to stress um, that the aspect of, aspect of violence, of aggressiveness, is also something which needs, needs to be cherished. Yes, but I, I think that uh, you, you, you challenge the the, the assumption that the human species is, is more or less unique, or human nature is more or less unique. I mean, if we all in this room uh, would make up a society, wouldn't we be better off uh, the more people were exposed to moral enhancement, as, a, as on average? Well, this is like, that's a very um, yeah. sort of a thought okay. example, which I think is, um, it, 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 um, it implies too many hidden assumptions, which, which I couldn't um, deal with now as a, in a short response. Okay. Uh, yes, sir, just on that last point, so I thought you were saying that society has been morally progressing, you know, there has yeah. been sort of moral enhancement. Then you were saying then that moral enhancement is a bit of a threat to diversity, will be the same. So, but clearly, so far, it hasn't really been a bit of diversity. We, we haven't become more homogeneous because of this moral progress. So let's just say a bit more about that. Okay, um, the moral enhancement, which which uh, the th uh, is a threat to diversity, is the one um, I think uh, which was mentioned uh, earlier this morning. So we ought to become more, more like men, ought to become more like women. In that case, if it goes into a certain direction, but the the moral progression, which is connected to um, which has taken place uh, from my analysis of the first part of the talk, actually leads to to create a plurality and diversity because it's connected to this notion which I regard as a central notion for morality. And that's the recognition of the importance of the norms of negative freedom and, and the norm of equality. And, and, and because only because um, so on, on several layers um, of our cultural development in, um, during the enlightenment process, we've been fighting for that. We are no longer, we no longer have 
um, the rulers who, political, religious rulers, who force us into a certain specific context, to live according to a certain specific context of the good life. And that's why it's such a wonderful achievement also um, that we now have established uh, the dominance um, of this. Um, it's an achievement, it's a progress, it's not an insight, it's not an eternal value, norms of freedom and inequality. I think it's something which we've been fighting for as scientists, as, as soldiers on a cultural level. And, and it is something we need to cherish and, and um, to actually apply these norms and to live in accordance with the norms of freedom and equality needs the various capacities, needs cognitive capacity, in particular I think cognitive capacities, um, but also uh, other uh, ways of understanding, grasping, analyzing, interpreting the situation we are in. And by reducing it to a type of moral enhancement, uh, moral bio-enhancement, which, which has been suggested before, it normally um, it's been talked about, well, oxytocin, um, then altering the level of serotonin, and you know, uh, accuracy. It's, it's always there for, because by using certain pharmaceuticals, you can only alter one specific aspect um, of human behavior. And so um, it's, it's, and to cross, to, to introduce a type of moral enhancement, which you know, the, the God's machine is, is, I don't think, I'm not considering that for the time being because I couldn't imagine how, how it would, you know, work like that. Yeah. Uh, you, you were saying that we make a very impossible claim about <coughs> when we say there hasn't been that much uh, <coughs> more development uh, since Confucius and whatever. And now we were making a, a sort of comparative claim. Uh, comparing it to scientific development, which has been a normal, it's formidable. Uh, but we also sort of point to certain things, certain aspects in which we, we think there has been development. And for instance, we do mention equality. Uh, but with respect <coughs> to human equality, uh, I think we make two points. One point is that, that the equality is only in certain respects, some sort of political equality, equality in some, some sense before the law and so on. But economic equality, inequality is huge today and, uh, and uh, it's sort of much greater than in many. Uh, uh, earlier period, certainly yeah, in, in hunter gatherer society, uh, because in, in, in those societies they didn't have many possessions. So there seemed to be a tendency for economic uh, inequality to grow in step with the amount of resources that there is in the society. So, so that, that, that one, one aspect. The other, I think, even more important point we make is that although there might seem to be equality between races and sexes and so on in the society, uh, <coughs> history shows that the society uh, very quickly can sort of sink into a, start, a state of total I mean, I hate to sort of make this case against <laughs> you, but it's sort of a German in the Second World War. I mean, it's, it's a certain, so uh, uh, obvious case. But, but it, it goes to show that the society can seem very civilized on the surface, and suddenly it sort of, uh, it sort of atrocious behavior uh, in, in erupts. And this is happening. In, in, so when is, when is this sort of remarkable moral development occur? Has it occurred since the Second World War? It's <laughs> very short. Uh, uh, I think, I, I mean, the, the sort of regressions of that sort makes me, make me sort of think that uh, deep down, I mean, there's still, uh, we still, in many respects, rather primitive. Uh, uh, so, so that, that's another sort of uh, thing. We, we sort of don't look at just doctrines 
people espouse, but on their behavior uh, as well. And it, 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 it's well known that uh, people tend to express uh, racist attitudes and when they think they're not. <laughs> Also, so, um. Yeah, you're definitely right. I mean, um, I, did, I, I didn't claim that sort of by promoting uh, cognitive capacity, it necessarily there's a necessary connection to a moral enhancement or moral betterment. Um, there's always a risk of, of, of things going slightly wrong at the end of in barbarism. Slightly. You know, sometimes just slightly, sometimes worse. Um, um, so there, there's not this necessary connection between cognitive development um, and, and moral development. But it, it seemed to me, sort of in your article, well, as you uh, just said now, um, that you, you, you had such a, you showed there's such a strong development in, in the sciences, um, but there's only just a little bit of a slight development, a little bit of equality concerning moral enhancement. And that just um, is, is so, Obviously, I may have mentioned some reason. This is so obviously doesn't correspond to what has happened in 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 in, in, the, in Europe. I mean, especially in the in the in the, uh, in the during the Enlightenment process. But you can also see it um, from the historical de development in in ancient Greece. There was no such concept of of, of the norm of equality in in a um, in a society. You don't find the notion of. Uh, equality in Plato and Aristotle. The Stoics were the first to introduce any equal form of no, uh, well, consideration. In the notion of humanitas in the Stoics, um, Cicero was the first to introduce the notion of dignity as applicable to, to all human beings as human beings. But then, uh, then it had a slight effect uh, for for the for the society because the. The slaves received a slightly higher attention, maybe got slightly less suppressed. It did have an effect in, in, in the community, um, but on a much more global basis, then the concept of dignity was revised again during the Renaissance times when it was taken up by Pico and others, and later on by Kant. And in the whole process, it was, it, there was this, uh, um, there were parallel procedures which took place. There was a movement away from this metaphysical and Christian understanding of the world. The sciences became more important. Leonardo da Vinci was the first who stressed uh, the painting um, as, as the central art. And parallel to this, there was an aggression or a fight against political and religious leaders too. Because um, in all these societies, um, the um, metaphysical, the, their metaphysics and the interest of the uh, leaders and their worldviews um, were, uh, were dominating the actions and the concepts of the good life of all the citizens. And I think it's been an immense moral progression which has taken place from that time on. In particular, um, the fight concerning us now having the chance of having our own concept of the good life, of being able to fulfill how we want to um, uh, how, how we want to, what we regard as appropriate, and the diversity now is enormous just by just going 20 years just, back. Uh, <laughs> we'll uh, like to ask whether somebody's yes. got a last question. I mean, quick one. Yeah, I was thinking uh, maybe uh, uh, mixing of the two uh, kind of uh, uh, aggression on um, uh, life. I mean, we thought about the same to uh, um, use these notions of aggressiveness and violence interchangeably. But it seems to me that uh, we have a positive uh, uh, aggressiveness and we have violence, which is uh, something bad. So, uh, it seems to me that your argument addresses uh, on this, uh, uh, say, ambiguity. When I was talking about the, yes, yes. Um, when I was talking about the concept of the good, um, I mean, what is important that sort of aggressiveness, um, some may say violence, is important in some respects. Sort of just the understanding of us, be, um, you know, losing, um, being less aggressive, being less violent, necessarily makes us moral better. Um, um, 
Firstly, this is not the case, and I've showed many examples when, um, um, which make it clear that aggressive behavior can be actually a moral behavior. I mean, just be re referring to, you know, inner and external security of a state just by, um, you know, by, by people trying to rob someone, someone else, and then you enter. You need force. <laughs> But in an everyday situation, just to, to stand up for oneself, one, one, sometimes, one very often needs a bit of aggression, one needs a bit of um, maybe even violence, but not every type of violence has to be sort of a, a morally bad or even legally forbidden type of violence. So I think one can make a lot of, um, um, uh, a lot of distinction between uh, uh, of, or shades of violence. That's it, say. <laughs> so, um, thank you. Um... <clears throat>